Lucy B.B. Tobias is our guest artist today. Welcome to our program, Lucy. First, can you tell us how you transitioned from photography to illustration? Oh, thank you, Nancy, for asking. Um, my first job in newspapers, I was a chief photographer, and I had to develop and print photographs for 13 different staff members. And I became totally hooked on photography. I thought it was an end in itself. And after a while, I started doing shows. I would show up on the weekends and have my photographs all framed. Um, but then one day, I went to Ellie Shearer Homosasso Wildlife State Park, and I hung out with the manatees. And I was taking pictures, and then I, I stayed for one feeding, and I came back for another feeding. I went to the underwater bowl where you could see them underwater, and I was just absolutely fascinated by them. So I came home, that was in Ocala at the time, and I had swimming sisters. We swam three times a week at 5.30 in the morning. And I, in between laps, I told them about this visit and about the manatees and the way they undulated along and how they were so cool. We started talking about manatees and that's where Mary Margaret was born. Well, I realized, uh, that I couldn't just use photographs. For instance, if you actually look at a manatee, they have faces only a mother could love. So I had to actually develop Mary Margaret Manatee, and I have to tell you that I had not done any painting or illustrating or anything since I was in my 20s because I'd earned my living uh, writing stories and taking pictures, and I'd just gotten away from it. I had to go out and buy watercolors. I had nothing. <laughs> so I set up a little uh, space on my dining room table, and every morning I sat down and imagined Mary Margaret Manatee. And this is the very first one that I came up with. She's smiling. She has lovely eyelashes, uh, not something you would see in real life, but she started to become herself. And a friend of mine who's an artist came over, I asked her to come over and said, would you give me a lesson in water? So we spent the morning with big sheets of watercolor paper and spraying them and throwing paint at them and rock salt and just having a wonderful time. And, and we did deep blue water for deep water and, and green water for water close to the surface. Then I cut those up into smaller pieces to use for Mary Margaret. But I realized that I had some wonderful photographs. And this is a real blessing. When I was with the New York Times Regional Group, they sent me to school. I got a degree in graphic design technology, and I thought, I can merge these two worlds. So I opened up Photoshop, and I put in a picture of some grasses that I really like. There's the grasses. That, that is an actual photograph of grasses. And now, tell me where this was taken. This was taken, um, this was taken at the Rainbow River. Uh, actual grasses waving in there, and I put a filter on so I could see through water. And I saw, and these are the very grasses that Mary Margaret eats. So I was oh, able, I, it was perfect, and I was able to put the photograph in of grasses, and then I could put Mary Margaret in with it too. So what I ended up with, and it's kind of sad to talk about it in a way because it's magic when you see the pages and then when you say how it's done you kind of deconstruct it. But Mary Margaret is now in the grasses. There's a place here, here she is, that's an actual photograph. But she's in the water oh, yes. with Billy Blue Heron. I knew I had to develop a series of characters. Billy Blue Heron, who's so sad and alone. Oliver the Otter, who likes to jump in the water. Rocky Raccoon, who, who helps with a picnic. All these characters had to be developed in watercolor as illustrations, and then I brought them into Photoshop, and I added them, uh, I added pieces of water. Like, here's Mary Margaret, and that water is, is also Rainbow Spring Beautiful. State Park. Yes, and, you, can and, see the, you can see the rainbow effect of the lighting from the surface of the water yes. in the picture itself. And Amazing. Mary Margaret, uh, uh, the same artist friend who was looking at my, my work as it progressed, said, you know, you have to make sure she is with the part of the water. So every Mary Margaret has actually, um, she's not 100% intensity. She's, she's actually backed off so that a bit of the water shines through her. Yes, yes. So she looks like she's in, in real life. So you have illustrations uh, put into put into uh, real life things. I took another class on how to do clouds. <laughs> how do you do clouds? 
Oh, and I so I could learn some of the hardest things. In yeah, the world that, it do. is. It is. But I knew she would poke her head out of the water and she needed clouds and sky. Yes. So I had to take that class, too. So my prep work was taking a class in water, buying new paints and then combining, taking taking my drawings. By the way, this Mary, Mary Margaret is smiling on the very first page. Mm -hmm. That's two weeks worth of work. Every single day I would sit down and work for about two hours and produce at least one or two Mary Margarets. I think that's what some of our listening audience does not understand, and that's the fact that you don't just sit down and scribble out a, a sketch and then fill it in with crayon right. like you did in the first grade. You know, some of these works of art, and actually when you buy a children's picture book, you're talking, how many pictures do you have in there? Uh, well, at least 20. Yeah, at least 20. I think the small, the, I don't know, some of the, some of the children's picture books could have as few as maybe eight right. paintings because one painting might cover two pages, but you've got to have, unless it's a board book, you've got to have at least um, 16 pages. Yes. So, and then some go up into... You know, another children's picture book might have as many as 40. And, it, and it's, the, the process involves, um, there's a great book called The War of Art by Stephen Pressman, where he deals with, a, where he deals with the uh, terrible resistance that we all have to getting anything done or making things happen. And his bottom line is, you got to show up every day. Yes. And that's what I did with Mary Margaret when I decided she had to make her real. I showed up every day, Monday through Friday. I gave her four hours. I gave her the best part of my day, which is morning. That's when I'm happiest and perkiest. And I would work on Mary Margaret. And, it, and I would know if it was right when it spoke to me. And this took two weeks to get the one that finally made it. But Billy Blue Heron took even longer because he was standing on the bank alone, but I didn't want to make him a figure that made you too sad. Mm -hmm. I, he needed to be lonely but approachable. Right, yeah. And that meant a lot of looking at blue herons. I moved to Sarasota somewhere during this process, and I found myself going to the Bay Park a couple of times a week, take my dog with me and my camera, and I was photographing herons in the shallows looking for fish so I could get that feel for what Billy Blue Heron is like. You know, it's interesting. Uh, different writers use different... Uh, processes in their writing. Um, Pamela asked me recently, she said, well, how do you do it? And I said, well, I just sit down and start writing, and pretty soon the story takes on a life of its own. As an artist, um, I don't know, I think it's more difficult yet being an artist even than being a writer, because the writer has an opportunity to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. And I know in my own art, um, I rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, and I, I know I waste an awful lot of paper before I finally get it to where I'm satisfied with it. Are you finding? Yes, that uh, um, Mary Margaret is a total of six years in the making. Um, my first book, 50 Great Walks in Florida, was published in 2006. In 2007, I had that experience at Homosassa and shared it with my swimming partners. Mm -hmm came home, did a few sketches, wrote a rough draft of a, of a story, and put it away on a file on my laptop. That was it. And she languished for years until I went to a class in Delan for children's illustrators in 2011, and I brought what little bit I'd done, and I said, well, here she is. She isn't much. And they said, we love her. <laughs> Make her happen. Yes. And they empowered me to finish Mary Margaret Manatee, oh, hanging out with other illustrators who were going through the same things, anguish that I had. Is it harder for artists? Yes, I think it is, because the words... The words uh, evoke images, and you have to make those images come to life. Yeah. One of my books, two of my books actually, were illustrated by a, uh, uh, an artist in Sarasota who's considered a graphic artist. And um, I said, so Lori, Lori Love Barry George, I said, Lori, would you like to illustrate my story? And she said, okay. <laughs> it took her a year and a half before she got... I think 
Oh, I forget. I think there were maybe 15 pictures uh, before she completed it. And it was interesting because she said, okay, I've got it down now. So when I do the next one, there won't be as much detail. So it'll go a lot quicker. So she did Brandon Grows Vine. I don't know what happened to her theory about no detail because it has to do with him getting a plant from his neighbor and it grows. It doesn't say in the story that it's a wisteria, but adults will recognize it's a wisteria. And if you've ever had one, they have a mind of their own. Oh, yes. And I imagine she's got a million leaves painted in that book. Wow. You know, the life of an artist is so difficult. Um, well, I don't know that it's difficult. It's very time consuming. Uh, it, takes, it takes a long time. It doesn't take a year and a half. Well, that's true. It, it didn't. When I when I hunkered down with Mary Margaret, I had her finished in five months. Yes. Um, along the way, I had readers and lookers who, you know, would. I mean, you, you don't exist in a vacuum. Even though you're working by yourself, then yes. they would say how she's coming, or if they thought a page worked or didn't work, and that was good feedback because they're my future readers too. Right. That's right. <laughs> um, one of the things about uh, uh, art. To being having the artist come out and play after all these years is that it's immensely satisfying. I mean, when I finally got the Mary Margaret that worked, I did a little victory dance around the, around the I mean, I was just one happy camper. Um, you get the same thing with writing when you're finally finished and you can say that's it. But with art, you get these little rushes as you go along. Yeah. You know, this little piece works. This this little piece of water works, this plant works, this butterfly works, and it's like, all righty now. Hmm. Uh, and that makes you want to do more. So your expertise is in poetry, or I'm sorry, in um, photography, photography, as well as illustration. So let's compare the two. Okay. My, my yes, I, thank you for asking. Um, my photography has consistently been on the path less taken. I'll go places that many other people have gone and I'll see things they didn't see. And those are the things that, 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 that that's interesting to me. Um, and, I, and I like to work with that. When it comes, and sometimes it's quite detailed, but when it comes to illustrating an art, I like to be suggestive, not definitive. Almost the exact opposite of my photography. Hmm. So when I used photography in the book, it was always uh, dimmed back and, and secondary. I let the illustrations that are suggestive take the front. Yes. The photography went to the back because it's very easy to get lost in the details of a photograph. I did have genuine fun along the way, like <laughs> Mary Margaret eats water hyacinths. So I went out to my pond in the backyard and there was a water hyacinth blooming. Oh. <laughs> so out comes the camera and the next thing you know we're pulling it out of the pond and we put it on a yellow fiesta plate and photographed it there and we're just having too much fun. That's the only photograph that ended up in the book by itself because it really worked by itself. Everything mm -hmm. else is suggestive but not definitive. Mm -hmm. Mary Margaret's a manatee but she's not like the manatees you saw in Homo Sassa. Actually, she's cuter. <laughs> I love the smile. I have to admit, I don't believe I've ever seen a manatee up close, nose to nose. Ah, you can do that if you go, uh, there's a number, in the back there's a study guide that tells you a number of places you can go to see manatees. Uh, right here in Sarasota, Moat Marine, they have two manatees in, in an aquarium where you can walk right up to the glass and watch them eating and and yes. see them up close and personal. Yes, and what is it they eat besides hyacinth? They eat, um, the, the, uh, if you've ever been in a, a canoe <coughs> on a river, you'll see these uh, big beds of grass that are long, long grasses that are uh, swaying in the current. They eat those too. They are completely uh, vegetarians. Hmm. In fact, I have a Q&A in the back that says, does Mary Margaret eat meat? And the answer is no. Oh, so in the back of the book you have interesting questions for the uh, children. Questions and also uh, there's uh, for, for the artist, uh, we have two coloring, two pages, one of water hyacinths and one of Mary Margaret with a question, you know, what does she do with her tail? She undulates. And then, uh, actually for older children, more like 8 to 12, 
how to help save Mary Margaret's friends and things you can do. Um, oh, what a good idea. Yes, yes. Uh, projects that you can get involved in. For instance, Billy Blue Heron can easily get his legs tangled up in a uh, fishing line. So people, if you're fishing, you need, if you cut your line, you need to roll it up and put it in the trash and take it home with you. Yeah. I was out on one of the public piers one day, and of course there are always fishermen out there, and a pelican came in. And as he's pulling the line with the fish on it, the pelican grabbed it. And I got there just in time to see the man pulling in one direction, the pelican pulling in the other direction. And I was really in a quandary because I couldn't decide if, you know, your first thought would be the man doesn't want to give up his fish. But if you think about it, in that fish, there's a hook. Yes. And you don't want that in the pelican either. It's a real danger. And yeah. so, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. I don't know how you would handle that. It's it's a very if he could get the pelican close enough that that people could throw a towel over it and get it, then they could probably they can't see get it. the fish out yeah. with the hook. Otherwise, he's going to cut his line, mm -hmm. and um, that pelican is going to eat a fish with a hook. With a hook in it. Yeah, yes. that that that's an issue. And um, one of the nice things about Mary Margaret is that she lives on a river and she makes friends. She tries to get a butterfly to come swim with her, and the butterfly tells her why she can't get wet. So so you start to get a sense of that web of life, which you just brought up beautifully, because the pelican is part of the web, the fisherman is part of the web, and they interacted. Yes. And sometimes it's not always a good interaction. Um, with Mary Margaret, the big thing is the boats, of course, um, oh, not yes. looking out for, for manatees. Manatees are very slow animals. They're very slow. Um, they really like to eat. So they're not in any hurry. I mean, if there's grasses and, and water hyacinths and plants, uh, they just mosey along having one continuous buffet. Yes. And unfortunately, because they're under the water, and mostly under the water, it's hard for boaters to see them. It is. And um, I noticed that very much at Homo Sassa. It was surprising to me how the manatees change color. If you look down at them through the water, they look like these dark blimps, almost like rocks, big rocks. But if they stuck their head out of water, it became uh, more greens and 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 colors, um, even yes. yellow okras, and more um, grays underwater, and even blacks. Very hard to see them. Um, they're slow moving, and they don't know they need to get out of your way. Yes, and even if they did know, they can't motivate that quickly. No, they're they're not able to. So it's up to us to look out for them. And that's a big issue because boaters say we just want to uh, charge right along. But they have manatee areas where you have to uh, watch out. And I, I think the salvation of the manatee is in our children who, who are going to read stories like Mary Margaret and then they're going to go out with their parents and their aunts and their uncles and their grandparents and their boats and they're going to say, uh, we need to slow down. Yeah. They I mean, will have the knowledge then. They have the knowledge. They are the saviors of the future of manatees. Yeah, of course, we're kind of lucky living in Florida. You know, I uh, grew up in the Midwest and lived for about 12 years in Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. But having moved to Florida, um, I realize the wildlife that we have down here is so different from any of the other states. And we are learning to live with the alligators in the pond and, you know, when to avoid, you know. Obviously, you don't feed them. Right. Um, you don't want them coming up to your house. You don't want to get to know them on a first-name basis. And, <laughs> like, with the manatee, you know, we love them. They're just so sweet and gentle. And we want the next generation to be able to enjoy them as well. We do, and one of the things in the, in the study guide it says you can help Florida manatees, and here's one of the suggestions. Write a manatee story that starts, if I were a manatee, and then you finish the story, finish the sentence, and be sure to add drawings. Yes. So I'm hoping that seeing illustrated Mary Margaret will encourage children to turn around and write their own manatee stories.